for coming tonight. I am so excited about this event. I can't even tell you. I am a huge fan of Paul's. This is Paul Shapiro. He's the author of Clean Meat. He's also been on TED, had given a few TED Talks. He's also the founder of Better Meats. I read your book cover to cover when I found it, and I don't do that for very many books, and ended up writing a whole summary of your book in my textbook. Just love it. Found it so uh, insightful and influential. And I'm sure all of you are going to find his thoughts and uh, insights here influential too. So we're super excited to have you. I'm excited, Melissa, and I read her book, Quirky. We didn't stage which this. You should read. It is a phenomenal look at what are the common traits of really, really influential innovators and inventors. Not like one hit wonders or they did one really cool thing, but people who have really done a lot in multiple fields or they've done really cool multiple companies like Dean, wow. Dean Kamen, <laughs> Elon Musk, Einstein. In fact, one little piece of trivia, and these guys over here cannot answer it because they already know the answer because I gave it to them today that I learned from Melissa's book. Okay, you guys ready? No Googling of any of this, all right? Who was the... Uh, I, we don't have control, but they can we raise the volume of the mic a little bit? Yo, Doug. Thank you. Okay, piece of trivia for you. Uh, the first time a woman won the Nobel Prize was who? Marie Curie. Marie Curie. That's Very right. good. Nicely done. The second time a woman won the Nobel Prize was who? That's Marie right. Curie. The third time a woman won the Nobel Prize. Oh, we might have to skip a few. I don't no. know if they're exactly in order. Was it the yeah, next one? It is. Yeah, it is. Oh. Anybody? Marie Curie's daughter. Oh. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Well, I'm going well, to do this again at the end. But I, <laughs> all right. Read her book, and you'll be a really interesting you're, conversationalist at cocktail parties. OK, you're embarrassing me now, but thank you, Paul. Um, I really want to understand what inspired you to write this book. Uh, when, you, when I read it, it was like totally new to me. Some of the stuff in there it hadn't even come across my radar. I'd never seen it in a Twitter feed. How did you find out about this? What, what kind of background work did you have to do? Did it take a lot of research? Just tell, tell us something about the beginning stages of writing this book. Well, uh, for decades, I've been very concerned about food sustainability, both from an animal welfare perspective, from a perspective of the planet and climate change, public health, and frankly, how we're going to feed 9 billion people in just 30 years from now. Because the problem is that the planet isn't getting any bigger. Humanity's footprint on the planet is getting bigger, but the planet is not getting any bigger. And we're not colonizing any other planets anytime soon. So as humanity continues to swell in our numbers, the question will be, how can we continue to feed all of these billions of new people, many of whom want to eat meat? They want to eat an American diet that's high in meat and eggs and milk, which are very resource intensive products to produce. And so it's a nightmare from an animal welfare perspective. It's a nightmare from a climate perspective, land use, ex uh, wildlife extinction, all of these problems it is exacerbating. And so the problem is that despite all of the publicity, we all know that these are problems and yet it doesn't actually influence most of us because meat consumption continues to rise. And so I have been worried for many years about what can we actually do to reduce the number of animals who are raising and slaughtering for food for, to help solve this very serious problem of food sustainability. And I, uh, I, while I wish that we would have a mass outbreak of plant-based eating, uh, I have a feeling that people are not converting to vegetarians because the evidence doesn't show it. In fact, uh, per capita rates of vegetarianism in the US haven't changed in decades. And on a per person basis, actually meat consumption is going up. It's going up here, it's going up in China, it's going up in Brazil and in India and Mexico and all the places where it matters most. It's going up. And so the question becomes, if giving people facts is not enough to change our behavior, what can we do that can actually make a difference? And the answer seemed to me to give people meat that doesn't have all the downsides. And so I had known about this idea of growing meat without animals. I'm talking about real meat here, not alternatives to meat, not substitutes meat, but real meat grown from animal cells. Uh, since around uh, like 20 years ago, because NASA had funded this research that was really intended for growing meat in space, but many people, including people in my social circle, when the study got published, they actually succeeded in growing meat outside of a fish. Uh, they thought, why do this in space? Why not do it here on Earth? And so I was friends with many of the people who were interested in this space. Okay, were they, grow they were growing fish outside the, of a fish? Yeah the, oh, okay. yeah, the first time any human successfully cultured animal cells to grow muscle um, was a goldfish, actually. Wow. And it was a NASA-funded study 20 years ago. 
in New York, by the way. Um, but anyway, so I was aware of this, but to me, it was always science fiction. It was never something that was actually a realistic possibility. I thought, huh, this is something cool in the future. Maybe if I had an interest or knowledge of tissue engineering, maybe I would devote myself to this. But it was always something I just kind of hoped would happen. But in 2013, when the first cultured hamburger was debuted by Mark Post, who's a, a Dutch physician who grew the first burger, which with funding from Google co-founder Sergey Brin, that's when I started thinking that this was actually something that was a true possibility. Now that burger costs over $300,000 to grow. You know, it's like the most expensive burger anyone's ever uh, grown or eaten. Um, but then, you know, you fast forward to like 2016 and Memphis Meats gets founded. And I was good friends, or so am friends with uh, Uma Valetti, the founder. And we were talking about this one time and he was a very successful cardiologist and uh, he was talking about leaving his job to go start this company. And I, uh, I, I stupidly gave him some bad advice. I told him, you know, you're about to enter the most lucrative earning career, of, earning decade of your career. You know, you're like 40 years old, like you, you're just gonna earn a ton of money. You could just pay other people to do this. Like keep earning the money and just, you know, if you really want this to happen, you're, you're gonna have a huge amount to donate or to invest. Um, but we agreed that somebody ought to do it. I just wondered whether he should fund it rather than lead it. Stupid me. Uh, thankfully, he did not take my advice and he started the company. And that's when I thought, somebody needs to write about this. Yeah. What were you doing at the time? At the time I was working in the animal welfare field okay. and I was primarily lobbying to pass laws relating to food sustainability, okay. the welfare of animals, climate change, and so on. And I had increasingly been coming to the thought that food technology may do more to solve these problems than public policies. It's not that public policies aren't important by any means, but it is that we are probably gonna have to innovate our way out of this. And we need policies to support the innovators, we need policies to help subsidize the research and so on. But I, I just thought, you know, the, the primary reason we stopped hunting whales in America was not because people felt bad for whales. It's because Abraham Gesner invented kerosene and patented it. And within uh, just a few decades of that type of invention, the whaling industry had been decimated by 95%. And people in the antebellum United States have been complaining about whaling for a long time. I mean, everybody had whale oil lamps, but people were very upset about the treatment of whales. In fact, there were letters to the editor in newspapers in antebellum America calling for the uh, cessation to our hunting of whales because they were concerned about extinction, you know, in the 1850s. And then in 1861, uh, a, a Harper's Weekly publishes this editorial cartoon of these whales all dressed in a beautiful black tie ball, clinking their glasses with a big banner behind them. It says, we whale no more for our blubber. And they're toasting to the kerosene industry for freeing them. Oh, wow. And if you think about the animal welfare movement in America, which was really founded right here in New York City, that after the uh, Civil War, many of the anti-slavery activists started these animal welfare groups like the ASPCA because they were concerned about the treatment of horses. And they crusaded for better treatment of horses. They crusaded for mandatory resting hours, watering stations, Sabbath days where the horses couldn't be worked. And then Henry Ford comes along and does more for horses than they ever dreamt of doing. You know, Henry Ford liberated horses without caring about them. And the list goes on. You know, the reason we don't use carrier pigeons anymore isn't because we don't care about, because we care about pigeons, because we have better ways to transmit information. So you look at all these categories of animals who have essentially been relieved of their, uh, of their service to humanity, to put it very mildly and diplomatically, um, by technology. And so I thought this could be the same. We could have a similar technology. And that is why I thought if we are going to ever reach a day where we actually are raising fewer animals for food, it's probably gonna come about through technology rather than just trying to persuade people to do the right thing. In other words, you can persuade people to turn off their lights more or you can invent a light bulb that just uses a lot less energy. Should do both, but the latter is gonna do more good. Gotcha, so, so you heard about UMA and how did UMA get started? What made a cardiologist think he could figure out how to grow meat outside of an animal? So Uma was a, uh, a donor to animal welfare charities. This is how I came to know him. And he ended up be, uh, being on the board of, um, of New Harvest, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to promoting cellular agriculture. And the pace of progress was glacial. And he thought, which I totally agreed with him, that if this remained in the realm of academia, it would never become commercialized. He thought somebody has to be the first entrepreneur 
to start one of these companies. And even though the first burger had been debuted a couple years earlier, nobody had started a company. This was all just academic research. And so Uma had been a promoter of this, uh, being on the board of New Harvest. But at some point he decided, I'm gonna take the very risky move. Uh, he was very high up. I mean, I think he was like the head of the Minnesota American Heart Association or the Minnesota chapter of the AHA. Um, I mean, he was high up in the field of cardiology. And he had been thinking since his days as a medical student when he had been implanting stem cells into patients' hearts and watching the muscle regrow, he'd been thinking about this, that if we can do it in a patient, why couldn't we do it outside of the patient? Why couldn't oh, we do it instead of using you know, heart muscle, we could grow the muscle that people eat. So he did have a connection to the technology. He had a huge connection with the technology and a passion for animal welfare. He grew up in India. He saw uh, some many scenes that I uh, detail in the book that really had a searing impact on him. Uh, relating to the treatment of animals who were being slaughtered. And he wished at that time that he could somehow be a part of ending that type of violence toward animals. Yeah. And lo and behold, a couple of decades later, now he's a pioneer in the space. And I think he's probably the best funded pioneer in the space too. Yeah, so they just announced their Series B, which is $161 million, which is a bigger raise for that round than all money invested in all other companies combined in this space. Wow. That's Memphis Meets, right? Memphis Meets, yeah. And that got funded by, I think, Bill Gates and Richard Branson. Yeah. And, and SoftBank, yeah. So okay, SoftBank, <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, but so I ended up having a whole group of tech MBAs uh, in a class that we teach. They, they're doing the alt meat space as a technological disruption. And they all got to pick different organizations to analyze and develop deployment strategies for them. And one of the groups yesterday, they were doing their practice runs for their deployments, cool. showed a slide and it had 27 different icons for companies that are doing cultured meat. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And 20, you know, 27. Fi yeah, five years ago there was zero. And now, uh, you and, know. And are any of them on the store shelves yet? Oh, no, 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 not one ounce of cultured meat has been sold anywhere on earth. So there's at least 28 companies working on this. Yeah, and, and even if, uh, no, no government has yet authorized the sale of these, but even if they did, you would have minuscule sales right now because okay. it still costs a lot to produce it's this. It's expensive. Yeah, and so, you know, as companies like Beyond and Impossible have really taken off with plant-based meats. And, the, and meat, those are plant-based meats. Yeah, right, okay. thank you. So with their plant-based meats, they've been taking off. And, you know, some people have wondered, like, well, do we really need cultivated meat, right? Like if Beyond and Impossible can make this product. Um, and, you know, I think it's kind of like saying if, you know, right now wind energy is, let's say, cheaper than solar, you know, you know, do we need solar? Well, yeah, you want an all of the above strategy, right? Like the problem of fossil fuels is so severe. You want wind, you want solar, you want geothermal and so on. Um, I was about to say you want nuclear. I don't want to create any controversy here, but probably want You don't nuclear. think you're creating controversy <laughs> with cultured meat? Yeah. yeah, you probably want nuclear too. <laughs> but anyway, point is, oh, I'll talk to Charles. He would know better than I. But uh, point is that uh, in the same way that fossil fuels are so serious or such a severe problem, you want lots of alternatives. Yeah. Factory farms are such a problem. You want lots of alternatives. You want yeah. plant-based meat. You want cultivated meat. You want meat grown from microbes. Uh, you want people to blend meat. I'm sure we'll talk about that later with plant-based and animal protein blends. Uh, you want people simply to eat less or no meat. I mean, there's all these options out there, but we need all of them. And so cultivated meat is still a very important strategy, but no, it's completely not commercialized and it will not be a major part of the protein industry for years to come. So it sounds like animal welfare issues brought you and Uma to this sphere. Yeah. But when I see people going vegan now, and it seems like there's a lot more vegan alternatives and more vegan restaurants and in Italy now to get the coveted food standard, you have to actually offer vegan, really good vegan items on your menu. So it's, it's taking off. But I, most of the people I talk to, for them, it's about uh, environmental footprint. Yes. So a lot of people might not realize uh, the the massive environmental footprint that cows make, for example. Yeah, so, you know, vegan eating is, is of course, far more mainstream now. Um, I, I made the decision to become a vegan in 1993, and I can assure you back then, people did not know what the word meant. When you told them, they thought you were from Vegas. Like, it was, they didn't, it was not the same as it is today. Um, and, and now it's like an embarrassment of riches because it's like you're driving, you're like, oh, should I go to Carl's Jr.? Should I go to Burger King? You know, like, all these vegan options are everywhere. <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, the, the short answer uh, to the question is that uh, if we're concerned about climate, if we're concerned about land use, wildlife extinction, and so many other pressing environmental problems, we must be concerned about energy, but we also have to be concerned about food. 
According to the United Nations, animal agriculture contributes about 15% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world, which is more than all of transportation combined, more than all the planes, boats, cars, trucks, all combined. And it's not just uh, climate change, which is, of course, the existential crisis that we face, but it is also uh, biodiversity problems, wildlife extinction, the number one cause of, of so many problems that are driving it. This is why uh, environmental groups like the um, uh, Center for Biological Diversity say that if you're concerned about wildlife extinction, the number one you, thing you should do is eat less meat. In fact, they have a whole campaign called Take Extinction Off Your Plate, um, which if you go to takeextinctionoffyourplate.com, it's uh, surprisingly nobody owned that URL. Uh, but um, it's, uh, they have a whole website just about why if you're concerned about wildlife extinction, the easiest thing you can do is to eat less meat because animal agriculture is such a leading driver of extinction. Okay, so um, somebody told me, and it, I might have read it, it might have even been something you wrote, but I read one day and I thought it was really cute, that uh, it, there's also a huge efficiency angle here because a cow is optimized to be a cow and there are a mm -hmm. lot of things involved in being a cow that aren't making meat that you can eat, right? So, yes. so there's some ratio of like how many calories that go into a cow to make one calorie of meat that's gonna yeah. be, that could be radically changed potentially. It is a lot of calories, you could say. Cow. Uh, thank you, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't even yeah. know I was gonna make that joke, so. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, look, Cows did not evolve to become efficient meat producers, right? They evolved with far different pressures on them. And uh, when you think about growing meat, one of the reasons why cultivated meat takes so many fewer resources is because you don't have to do all the things that a cow does. You don't have to produce a skeleton and horns and eyes and intestines and all the things that calories into the cow are actually going toward when you can just devote the calories in toward growing the meat that people actually want to eat. And so, you know, the statistics vary and it depends on what type of uh, agricultural system you're using. But no matter what, you're talking about at least 10 and probably more calories into the cow for every one calorie that you're going to get out in the form of edible flesh. Wow. And so why not become a lot more efficient? Why not use a sliver of the resources of the land, the water, the emissions that are needed uh, to grow meat rather than to raise a whole animal? In fact, it was Winston Churchill who in 1931 predicted this. In, in a 1931 essay, before he became prime minister of Britain, he wrote this essay called 50 Years Hence. And it is essentially a prediction of what the world would be like in 50 years. And he predicted that we would escape what he called the absurdity of raising an entire chicken just to get the wing that we want. Now, he may have been off by a few decades, but he was pretty prophetic because just a few decades after his prediction, people are actually now growing uh, cultivated uh, chicken nuggets and chicken, uh, other types of uh, beet, uh, meat products, and I've eaten them many times. In fact, I'm proud to say I think that I've eaten a greater variety of queen meats than any other person on the planet. Now, having eaten queen beef, duck, fish, liver, chorizo, even foie gras. Um, when you're writing a book, all these people want to bring you in and let you eat it. Uh, but even just uh, about last month, I ate two different companies' queen fish. I ate a, a yellowtail and a um, salmon in one week. Like fish? So first, to me, yes, but Melissa, you know, I'm, I'm not the uh, target audience here, so. Um, Do you I've, remember you know, what fish tastes like? Yeah, I think so, but you know, I, I would, it would be better to do a back-to-back -back blind taste test between yeah. that product and, Sushi. and fish. Yeah, that would be a better thing to do. Right. But yes, to me, it tasted like fish. Okay. And, and it, I mean, the, it, it should taste like fish because it is. You know, it's not like you're taking plants and trying to get them to taste like meat. These are actual fish cells that but are the just- the texture in, must be different. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you can grow, in one case it was a whole muscle, in the other case it was a uh, ground, uh, but yes, I mean, you, uh, you can probably tell textural differences in some cases. I didn't do back-to-back -back tasting, okay. so, so I don't know. Cool. Yeah. You know, one of the, uh, you made an analogy in your book, and you actually told a story from history that I found really powerful, and it was about ice. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'll let you tell it, because you'll do it better than I will. Um, not ice of the vanilla kind, but rather ice of the... Um... These guys are too young to remember vanilla ice. <laughs> I don't know. I think that there's some people in here. Okay. Um, so uh, if you rewind the clock 150 years, actually the same time that whales were dodging harpoons in the Atlantic Ocean, at that time, uh, the only way that anybody had to get ice was from nature. There was a big ice industry where people were harvesting big blocks of ice from lakes where it had naturally frozen. And they created insulated boats and they shipped it all over the world. They shipped it all over, including, interestingly enough, even to India, where people, of course, had never even seen ice. 
However, it wasn't for the Indians, it was for the British colonizers who were really hot on the subcontinent, and so they wanted to buy this ice. But the point is that you had a major ice industry creating barrens of ice. And then you have the advent of refrigeration. Well, they had to ship it. They yeah, it was being shipped like it. in a truck. Oh, well, there were no trucks, but oh. there were boats. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> highways <laughs> they, had no, there weren't a lot of highways moved, back in the 1850s. The yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you had this major ice industry. And then you have refrigeration. And all of a sudden, you have a much more efficient way to produce ice. Instead of getting it from nature, you make it through technology. But it's still ice, right? However, the ice barons were livid over this technological innovation, and they railed against what they called artificial ice. They said it's unnatural, it could, it could sicken your kids, it goes against God, that God has provided <laughs> ice, and now you're gonna take this into your hands and you think that you can do this? Well, you know, at that time, the irony was that the uh, artificial ice was actually safer because they were uh, filtering or boiling the water before they cooled it into ice. And whereas the ice of that era was, you know, coming from a time during the Industrial Revolution where the waters were quite polluted and they didn't have cars yet. And so, you know, they had horses dragging this ice out, then train the horses to hold it in during this time. So you've got horses dragging this ice out of polluted lakes versus filtered water that's getting uh, frozen into, into, what? into ice. And so it was actually much safer is the ultimate irony. But you fast forward to today and... Needless to say, we all have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. We don't think there's anything unnatural about it at all. And we dropped the artificial moniker. I suspect that in the future, we're going to think about meat in a similar way. That for millennia, just in the same way we only had to get, the only way to get ice was out of nature, the only way we had to get meat was out of animals' bodies. Well, now we invented a technology to take the same substrate, animal cells, or water, but now animal cells, and make meat. And some people may think of it as somehow an artificial method, but I think that in the future, people are gonna think, thank God that we invented this way to do this in a much cleaner, safer, more sustainable, and more humane way. That I'm so glad that we no longer have to raise and torment and slaughter billions of animals in order to produce the meat that we want. And so I'm pretty bullish on the concept that we can use technological innovation to create a better world. It's not to say that anything from nature is bad, but it is to say that nature can sometimes be improved upon. Smallpox, high child mortality rates, poison ivy, these are all natural. Uh, you know what's unnatural? Reading, uh, <laughs> anesthesia, <laughs> uh, and so on. So in, this is a case where I think well, we can improve on nature and we can do mm. something that actually is going to be better for the planet because we used a technological innovation. I mean, I think it's a nice analog because I hadn't thought about the water being filtered for the ice. But so you're saying that the when you make ice at home, it's cleaner than ice dragged from a lake. Yeah. How many of you want to eat ice out of out of the Hudson <laughs> River? I mean, like no, not one person would do that. But I've also heard that if they when they make this, um, let's say they make beef grown in a lab, it won't have any of the bacteria, won't have any of the antibiotics or the steroids. Like it, it's supposed to actually last longer because it, it won't be as contaminated with all this stuff. Yeah. So think about raw meat now. Right now, if you are going to go to the supermarket and you buy raw meat, they tell you to treat it almost like it's hazardous waste, right? Like if you go put it in a separate bag, can't touch your other groceries, take it home. If it touches your counter, you got to disinfect your counter. If it touches your hands, you got to wash your hands. But they don't tell you to do that with your zucchini. And the reason is because there's feces in the meat. Uh, e. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, these are intestinal pathogens that can sicken us if we don't cook the crap out of our meat, literally. That's what you do, you cook the crap out of the meat. And only that makes it safe to consume. Whereas with clean meat, it's called clean meat, yes, because it's an allusion to clean energy, but it's also just cleaner. Think about it. You're not growing intestines, so you don't have to worry so much about intestinal pathogens. You're just growing that muscle. And for that reason, you're right, Melissa, that if you are to take a regular piece of meat and a piece of meat that is grown, and you put them in containers next to each other at room temperature, it's much longer before the queen meat starts to go bad. Now, that's, I mean, they're still gonna tell you to refrigerate it, obviously, they want to be safe but you will have far fewer concerns about food safety with this type of meat than the meat that we have today. Okay, so now let's talk about plant meat for a minute. Uh, what is the environmental footprint of plant meat? How do you see these two facing off against each other from an environmental perspective? So it's an, uh, it's an important question and I am going to answer it, but before I do, I just wanna say, I believe that very few people consider the environment when we buy food. Some people do, younger people especially, but most people I think buy food for th on three, reasons. Taste, price, and convenience. Mm -hmm. But 
there's many people, including the, your, the fact that you're even here tonight, probably means that you have a concern about the sustainability of your food. And so um, let me answer the question. Plant-based is going to be better for the planet. It's, okay. it's going to take fewer resources. Uh, less I, I, energy. Yep, it'll be less energy. It will be um, it just fewer resources in general, not just energy, but in general. Um, and so the better that plant-based meat gets, the better we will have um, a chance of saving the planet. Uh, at the same time, lots of people want what they perceive as the so-called real thing. There's lots of people who will view plant-based meat as good as it gets as a substitute. And for those people who want the so-called real thing, I think clean meat is a really important innovation to allow them to literally have their meat and eat it too to let them eat the same exact product that would have come out of an animal, except now it's grown without having to take that animal into consideration. Yeah, so that's interesting mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, bacon, for example, is a product where I've never had a, a plant-based bacon that I thought replicated regular bacon. Yeah, yeah, it's like the holy grail, Melissa. Yeah, bacon so, is yeah, the holy grail, yeah, that's good yeah. to know. Um, it's tough. It's a pretty complicated type of meat. But it's interesting, you know, I have family in Texas that, looks at me like I'm talking some serious smack when I talk about any type of alternative meat. And, <laughs> and they, actually, they actually seem like almost offended by it. It's heretical to them. And do you think one of the others is going to, what is your hypothesis on which of these is going to be more acceptable to the sort of vehemently carnivorous yeah. people, population, or will they not adopt either of these? Oh, I think there will be adoption. I think that, um, I don't think it'll ever be total displacement. I mean, we still have horse-drawn carriages, so, you know, but I, I do think it'll be perceived as like a quaint relic of a, of a distant past. Um, but if I, were, uh, if I were placing bets right now, I guess if I were an investor and were placing bets, I, I would probably be betting in the plant-based space right now. But I'm very glad that there are investors who are so enthusiastic about clean meat because I think in the future, as these costs come down, that yes, I, I really do think that they're going to play a really big part of the future meat market. And they'll live in parallel. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I am. You know, I started a, a plant-based company, so you can tell where I think the most urgent need is right so now. So Better Meats is plant-based. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we can get into that too. I'm happy to talk about well, it. I was going to we'll, ask you about that later. Okay, but, we'll get know. into it later. Right. That's cool. Well, we can do it whenever you want, actually. But I'm watching the time uh, here. All right. Okay. Um, so in short, uh, I think that. You know, the, the, the space is wide open. Like people think, oh, we already have Beyond and Impossible. What more do you need? Well, um, as uh, Dan and I were talking about earlier, when you look at the space right now, like burgers and the plant-based are like this much of it. Chicken is like this much. Pork is like this much. And then seafood is like this much. And then eggs are like this much. Oh, milk is like this much too. Milk's but, doing well. Yeah, milk is doing really well. But even all of that, all the beef, pork, chicken, fish, all of that is still less than 1% of the meat market. You know, you take milk as an example, plant-based milk is now 13% of the fluid milk sales in this country. Yet plant-based meat is still under 1%. Less than 1% of the meat market is plant-based. And so if you're thinking about getting involved in this space yourself, I wouldn't think about it as saturated. I would think about it as a wide open white space where there is so much more that we need so many more companies, so much more innovation, so many more categories of meat. I don't understand why, for example, um, people are, you know, you have burgers which are trying to compete on cost with commodity beef, which is very cheap, whereas for the same price, you could be making crab or lobster and compete on cost with the actual crab and lobster if you're doing plant-based crustacean meat. Uh, like so, target the high end. Yeah, so you have, I mean, you know, vast numbers of crabs and lobsters are boiled to death for this market, but why, you know, if you're going to compete on cost with the meat, why not go for these more expensive meats that are still going to have a big impact uh, from a, both animal welfare and sustainability perspective? So if anybody's out there thinking about starting a company, think crab and lobster. It's a good low-hanging, I was going to say a low-hanging fruit, but it's more like a low-hanging crustacean. Yeah, it's probably even more expensive than that stuff than that if we really put our minds to it. I, uh, okay, so what about that? So um, going back to the cultured meat thing, mm -hmm. the biggest obstacle has always seemed to me, well, the cost is huge, and then yeah. the ick factor. Mm -hmm. And I used to think the ick factor was going to be a really big obstacle. And then I started seeing people eating like crickets and bugs and other <laughs> things, which to me still is ick. But I, I guess people get over ick pretty quickly. 
Nice, very good. They do. Um, I quick, totally. Quick, quick, yeah, quick. thank you. I, I got <laughs> it. Took me a minute. You got it before I yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I think you're right, Melissa. I, I think you know if you look at the three biggest hurdles for the cream meat companies, it's going to be uh, cost, government regulation, and uh, consumer acceptance. What about like and, also the the existing beef industry or poultry industry? Are they fighting this? Yeah, I'd say that's like a government regulation perspective. Yeah. So if it's cost, government regulation, and consumer acceptance, the re the resistance from the cattlemen, so to speak, is at the government regulation to either try to outright ban it, which they're trying to do. So for example, in Washington state, uh, they introduced a bill, did not become a law, but they introduced a bill that would have just banned the sale of cultured meat. And uh, banned it. it would have just banned the sale, not regulated what it could be called. Based on what? Uh, uh, protectionism. I mean, that's the only, only wow. real answer. Um, but other states, you know, they're trying to pass laws saying that you can't call it meat, which is, you know, not only obvious protectionism, but it's also a problem because let's say you're allergic to fish. This is fish. Like, is, this isn't artificial fish. It's not plant-based fish. This is actual fish. So if you're allergic to fish, you will be allergic to clean fish. Um, so for lots of reasons, we, you know, should so not be doing that. accuracy and labeling, yeah. you kind of have to call it fish. I, I think so. But to your point about the ick factor... I think this is the least of the concerns um, in that if it tastes good and it's affordable, people will eat it. I mean, just think about how we produce meat today. Most people eat meat today not because of how it's produced, but really in spite of how it is produced. I mean, think about it. You know, most chicken that we raise today comes from birds who are confined by the tens of thousands, wing to wing, in windowless sheds, living in their own feces, pumped full of antibiotics, and they never see the sunlight, and then when it's time to slaughter them, of course, nobody wants to hear what happens next. And so you just think about how unnatural, unsustainable, and inhumane our current methods of meat production are, you think, actually, queen meat seems like the naturally preferable option. And it's not just that. We can look at the actual consumer surveys on this. And depending on how you ask the question, depending on what you call it, if you want to call it something yeah. disgusting, like lab-grown meat, or if you want to call it something nicer, like queen or cultivated meat, you get wildly different responses. But even the most pessimistic, even the ones that are the worst worded surveys, still find that about 20% of people say they'd be happy to eat it. And to, I mean, 20%, that's a massive, massive number. I mean, imagine if 20% of the meat industry were replaced by clean meat. It would have economic consequences that would be complete, I mean, so dramatic, it's hard to even imagine. Yeah. Um, and so, Plus, once 20% of the people right. are doing it, that tips right. the market. Exactly. Right? It becomes then totally suddenly, normal. Because anybody is willing to do it. It becomes totally normal, yeah. Okay. So I, I, I mean, I, I believe that people will be very happy to eat it. Think that Especially if it's cheaper. Yeah, and you know, look, yeah, well, if it's cheaper, it's a game over at that point. But even when it's more expensive, I think there'll be a lot okay. of people who are happy to eat it. And I mean, there's lots of foods that are that seem strange. I mean, think think about actually, consider a time like after we domesticated cows, but before we invented cheese. So people are drinking milk, but they've never heard of cheese. They never envisioned brie or gouda or swiss or american or cheddar or anything right is a completely novel culinary experience to all humans nobody's ever even contemplated it let alone experienced it and now it's like widespread right i mean you know like cheese consumption is widespread even though two-thirds of humanity is lactose intolerant you still have cheese consumption all over because people really like the taste of it mm -hmm. and so you could have said at that time oh this is a novel food nobody's ever eaten this before but you can see how over time it becomes the norm and people get used to it. And I actually think that something similar will be true with clean meat because it doesn't have to merely mimic the animal products of today. It can also create entirely novel culinary experiences that no one has ever had before. So, uh, you know, actually, let me tell a brief story if I may. Yeah. All right, so go back to 1830. In 1830, you had this new railroad that was being built. It's being built from Baltimore all the way to Ohio, which was like the West in 1830, was Ohio. Anybody ever hear of this railroad? Baltimore to Ohio? b and Somebody plays Monopoly here. Yes, great property to buy a Monopoly. But the b and Railroad Barons were building this railroad. And the rail cars back then uh, were dragged by horses. You had, these, um, you had these rails, and the horses would go against them. Well, there was one entrepreneur, a guy named Peter Cooper. And Peter Cooper invented a rail car that he called the Tom Thumb. 
And this was a rail car that was powered by a steam engine. And nobody believed that a steam engine could ever do better than horses. They thought, oh, this is crazy. It's not going to be able to survive going around the bends and the turns. It's not going to work. And so the stagecoach company that was leading the way and was going to supply the horses for the B&O Barons were very upset by Peter Cooper going around touting this. And they threw down a challenge to him. They said, Tom Thumb versus our fastest horse. OK, 1830, fastest horse versus Tom Thumb. So he accepts it, as any good entrepreneur would. And they line up in Baltimore, parallel tracks. They got the Tom Thumb versus a regular car with their fastest horse the stagecoach company had. And they were off to the races, each carrying this car full of their human masters, the biological horse versus what would come to be known as the iron horse. So they're going, right? And they're neck and neck, neck and neck, going about half a mile. All of a sudden, Tom Thumb switches a belt. Stalls, stops, the horse ends up winning the race. Stagecoach company is really thrilled. They say, see, we told you we're totally vindicated. But the B&O Barons were so enthusiastic about the Tom Thumb because they saw that for half a mile it actually kept up. And they placed orders with Peter Cooper, turning him into an extremely rich man. In fact, anybody here ever heard of Cooper Union, named after Peter Cooper because he became a major philanthropist after this? Um, but the point of the story is this. If you think about the trains of 1830, which the Tom Thumb went 18 miles an hour. And then compare them to the trains of today, where we have trains that are going 200 miles an hour. Well, we don't have them, but if you go to China, they have them, <laughs> all right? 200 miles an hour. Or if you listen to Elon Musk, we're gonna have a Hyperloop that's going 700 miles an hour, right? And so that's how much better in 150 years trains have gotten. Well, how much better have horses gotten in that century and a half, right? Basically none, they're basically the same animal. And so you had huge innovation in trains because we divorced our transportation from a live animal and created a technology that could keep on getting better and better. Well, how much better are cows and pigs and chickens going to get? Not that much more efficient, not that much better, and they're going to be pretty much probably the same animals in the future as they are today. But when we divorce meat consumption from livestock rearing, how much better can meat consumption get? Can we create new experiences like cheese like new novel foods. Like for example, imagine if you go to your friend's house right now and they have a, a bread maker or an ice cream maker on their counter. Totally unremarkable. But what if they had a meat maker? What if they were ordering stem cells that they could drop in like a little tea bag and make their own meat right there? Or if you think about a turducken, right? Anybody here ever eat a turducken? You know, it's a chicken stuffed inside of a duck, inside of a turkey. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but you eat all three birds' meat at one time. <laughs> well, instead of just stuffing one bird inside of another bird inside of another bird, what if you could grow their cells all together and interweave their proteins, making a type of meat no one has ever eaten before? Uh, so I, I think that in the same way that trains are dramatically different now than in 1830, but all of them are better than horses, I think that meat in the future is going to be a lot better now, and all of it is going to be better than farm animals. That's really cool. Um, so, a lot of business and economics uh, people in here. Let's. What are your thoughts about what the key challenges or opportunities are that are facing plant-based meat and cultured meat from a business point of view? Like, where are the big challenges and opportunities? Yeah, biggest challenge is um, creating products that really do the job that mimic the taste and texture of meat and uh, scaling them up. As big as Beyond and Impossible are, they are still a minuscule fraction of the meat industry. Um, there's about 100 billion pounds of meat that are sold in the United States each year. And last year, there's probably about 200 million pounds of plant-based meat that was sold in the United States. So I'm no mathlete, but I think that's about 99.8% of the meat sold is coming from conventional animal agriculture. Okay. And so just think about it. Even if you had a quintupling of demand for these products, you're still at 99% to one. And so we just need a lot more scale up in this space. We need more companies, we need bigger companies, we need more capital coming into the space. That's what I see, and, and more innovation, because people want meat. The reason why Impossible and Beyond have taken off is because they marketed their products not to vegetarians, but to meat eaters who want meat but want to have better meat. And so that, I, I think, is going to be a, a key thing. But I would suggest that even as important as it is for those things to happen, even if we did have a quintupling of demand for plant-based meat, the fact of the matter is that we're still gonna have most meat coming from animals for a long time. And that is why I think um, we need to start not only putting plant-based protein in the meat aisle at supermarkets, which is what Beyond really pioneered, but not just put plant-based protein in the meat aisle, but to put it in the meat itself. 
And that's what we at the Better Meat Co. do, which is a startup that I co-founded uh, nearly two years ago uh, to make plant-based protein formulas that we sell as ingredients to meat companies so they can use fewer animals. So we sell plant-based protein formulas that work to seamlessly blend directly into meat so that if you eat, let's say, a chicken nugget or a hamburger patty, it might have a third or even half less meat in the product, but you won't notice any difference. It'll taste the same, it'll look the same, but it'll have much less saturated fat, much less cholesterol, many fewer calories, more fiber, more sustainable. It's just a better product. It is literally making better meat. We're teamed up with one of the biggest meat companies on the planet, Purdue Farms, the chicken company, which makes a 50-50 blend called Chicken Plus, which is 50% chicken, 50% plant-based. Really? Is this really? on the store shelves already? It's in 7,100 grocery stores right now. Safeway, Albertsons, Kroger, Walmart. Wow. You can go get those Purdue Chicken Plus products. And so think about that. Like if plant-based meat is still less than 1% of the meat market, what if every meat producer were to put our product into theirs at a 30 to 50% inclusion rate? The actual sustainability benefits would be dramatically bigger, right? Because instead of reducing demand by 1%, you're reducing demand by 30 or 50% in that case. And so that's the whole premise behind the Better Meat Co. And we're very proud of that partnership. Um, we're proud that some of our investors from Green Circle Capital were in the audience tonight also. They had the foresight to see what we were doing and recognize that this was also a good idea. But it's a... Um, it's an innovation that is in a space that really nobody is pursuing yet um, because uh, most people are focused on plant-based or cultured, but I think that um, in the same way that electric cars are still less than 1% of the vehicle market, well, you know, hybridizing uh, auto technologies would really go a long way. We are hybridizing meat. And, and was it hard to win Purdue over to this idea? Actually, Purdue, for a major poultry company, I'd say is a pretty innovative and, and progressive company for this. So um, they have been interested in it from the very first time I talked with them. Um, but they're a huge company, so it takes a long time. It's a long lead time between first conversation to actual going to market. Um, it was about a year for us of working with them before it hit stores. Um, but it's a product that's selling well. In fact, it's selling so well that Purdue's CMO announced at the Good Food Institute conference this year. Uh, we have Victoria Ram from the Good Food Institute sitting up there. At her conference, uh, the CMO of Purdue announced that they like this blended chicken product so much that they're devoting 50%, 50% of their entire 2020 marketing budget just to the Chicken Plus line. Wow, so we're going to start seeing ads on TV. If you haven't yet, Melissa, you should. But I, I, I hear from TV. people all the time who have tell me they're seeing their ads. I hear regularly people texting me videos of the ad and oh, so on. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. So your business is doing you. really well. Uh, we are doing well. We need to be doing better, but we're doing well. Well, you're yes. always going to feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I, um, we'll see. So what do you? So I heard that Tyson and Cargill, who are like two of the largest meat packers in the world, have made investments in the cultured meat space. That's right. Have they also made investments in the plant meat space? They have, yeah. So Tyson invested in... Um, in uh, New Wave Foods, which is making uh, plant-based shrimp. Oh. And so there is investment in both sides on plant-based and cultured. But uh, those companies, you know, they see themselves more as, I would say, like in the meat space. So I think they're probably more naturally gravitating toward the cultivated meat space. Right. Um, but they're invested in both. In fact, uh, Cargill just made a $75 million investment in Puris, which is the pea protein maker that, uh, for Beyond Meat. So um, they're definitely positioning themselves as a major ingredient supplier to the plant-based meat industry. So I had early on totally pictured small startups displacing these great big incumbents in these industries, but it actually sounds like maybe these heavyweights, they're, they're going to do the disruption themselves. It's totally possible. Uh, I see two different types of meat companies out there. I see the Kodaks and I see the Canons. And so if you go back 25 years, Kodak and Canon vying for supremacy in the film market, and both of them knew about digital. In fact, Kodak invented digital, but they thought it would cannibalize their business. And so they suppressed it, whereas uh, Canon instead really went for it. And we all know what happened, right? Uh, Kodak declared bankruptcy. Canon is now the largest manufacturer of digital cameras on the planet. And so Canon was willing to sacrifice their entire business of print photography, pretty much, to go to this new innovation, just in the same way that Netflix was willing to sacrifice DVD mailing for streaming. Their whole business, right. which put, you know, it wasn't streaming that put Blockbuster out. It was really DVD mail-ins. And then they became a streaming company. So if meat companies see themselves as forward-thinking innovators, they will be embracing this. But I don't think all the meat companies do. Some of them do, but not all. Okay. And are regulatory hurdles slowing things down significantly? And you know, we live in New York. I spend a lot of time in California, and those are probably not representative states. So what yeah. are you seeing? <laughs> Sadly, they're not. Um, but I will say the following. You know, there are regulatory burdens that states are seeking to place right now. 
to protect the local meat industries, they're trying to place rules on what you can call plant-based meat. For some reason, calling a hamburger a hamburger despite it having 0% ham does not bother them. For some reason, calling it a hot dog despite having 0% dog does not bother <laughs> Most them. Most of the time, hopefully. But yeah, maybe not 0%, <laughs> but we'll say. Uh, for some reason, calling it peanut butter does not bother them despite it having no butter in it. The list goes on and on. But calling it plant-based meat or calling it a plant-based burger, that seems to be really upsetting to them. And I don't think these laws are... But that's being are, driven probably by lobbying from people with a financial interest. That is certainly true. Um, but those are regulatory hurdles that mm -hmm. the plant-based meat industry will have to, uh, have to overcome. And the Good Food Institute is doing a good job of lobbying against those bills. And do you think we're do you think we're getting to a tipping point? Does it look like a lot of these companies are going to be successful? Well, I mean, we all know that the mortality rate for startups is very high. So I would like to say a lot of these companies will be successful, but the history of startups tells us that most won't be. Obviously, Better Meat Co. is going to be a multi-billion dollar exit. Obviously. But, the, uh, but for the rest of these losers, uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you know, nobody knows who's going to win right now. Uh, okay. I mean, we have no idea. Company, just being first to market doesn't mean that you're going to win, right? There's right. lots of companies no, that were first to market first, that didn't win. It's so. usually not the first to market who wins. Yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, it's, there's a saying that it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, and uh, I certainly think that's true here. Okay, well, why don't yeah. we open it up to questions from the audience? Um, do you, you want to pick them? You pick them. You're good at this. All right, I, I, I want the power of picking. I like it. All right, we go to Gabriel up here. Thanks for a great uh, discussion. Um, one comment that I'd like to hear from you is, is it possible that the negative aspects of the real meat industry that they've done over the last five years, including Purdue and others, of over-injecting the animals mm -hmm. with antibiotics, and et cetera, et cetera, has that, in a way, been an opportunity mm, I see. for the alternative meat, let's call it, whether it's cultured or whether it's plant food, because yeah. it got to the point where the meat didn't have any taste. Huh. I've heard many people say that. So, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, there is, I was just in Atlanta um, uh, yesterday and I was at this big poultry industry convention and like antibiotic free is like all the rage there. So, you know, many of these companies are trying to move and Purdue has stopped using antibiotics altogether. But uh, to answer your question, I mean, I've heard many people say that and I, I do think that this is one reason why people are switching to plant-based meat. It's not the only one, but I think it is one reason why people are switching. But if people also are buying these high-end antibiotic grass-fed beef, it also creates more cost parity with these cultured meats, which is probably a good thing, right? Yeah, so there's a lot of externalized costs in the meat industry today, and as they start internalizing those costs, uh, you do help to level that playing field a little bit more. Um, it wouldn't necessarily completely level it or make them completely cost parity, but um, we're very proud that at the Better Meat Co., our plant-based beef enhancers are cost competitive with beef today. So does and your so, like if I get if I get a I'm I'm this is not I'm not just trying to sell your business or anything like this but let's you, say you I, can do that Melissa. Get, <laughs> that's cool hamburger to hamburger yeah. are you cheaper the same more expensive than regular like quality ground beef um, yeah for sure so we would well uh, I gave we you would, three choices there uh, well all of the above oh. so we're we're gonna be better on saturated fat better on cholesterol better on calories better on fiber and yes better on cost cheaper and better on taste. Wow. Yeah, in blind taste test focus groups, what you find is that, generally speaking, our, um, the product just tastes better when you have our product in it for and a variety that, of reasons. That's yeah. super cool. Okay, other questions? Uh, all right, let's go to this gentleman with the glasses right there. Yes, sir. I feel so powerful getting to choose. All right, you've got your book open. You look ready. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, in 1993, you said this. This is like, meet the press. <laughs> What do you think is going to be an, uh, be an impact on jobs? Because uh, coming from a country, I come from India, and 60% of the country is directly involved in agriculture, and 90% of the country is dependent on it. Yeah. So what do you think is going to be the impact? Sure. Well, this won't replace agriculture, but it will change where certain agricultural jobs are. So um, think about the impact, let's say, on the tobacco growers as people stopped smoking, right? We have fewer acres planted for tobacco now, and they had to switch to other crops. In fact, interestingly, um, I don't think there's a causal correlation, but there is a correlation between reduction in smoking in the U.S. and increased consumption of hummus. And so, uh, really? yeah, so many of the tobacco growers switched over to growing chickpeas. Uh, once Sabra got acquired by Pepsi, they needed a lot more chickpeas. And so 
you know, a lot of tobacco growers switch over. And so, yeah, look, I don't think that cattle ranchers are gonna become microbiologists, obviously, but I do think that those microbes need to eat and you have to grow food for them. So there will be a disruption in the economy, no doubt about it. Um, but that's, you know, what happens. I mean, you know, when I am on an airplane tomorrow, I, or on Saturday, rather, I can promise you I'm not gonna be shedding tears for Blockbuster as I'm streaming Netflix flying across the country. Um, and, you know, Blockbuster employees lost their jobs. Um, and because we had a better alternative. And so the key is, I think, to figure out how we can continue creating an economy that offers people jobs, but they don't have to be the same jobs that people have always had. Mm. All right, Bakley. We're going to you next, ma'am, don't worry. Uh, I'll be quick. You have three questions? Uh, uh, wow, all right, I don't uh, know if we're going to you next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just curious because we, we were talking in the office and I have this theory and I wondered if you either validate or dispute it that simply taking on nuggets and burgers, you would make a lot of headway. I mean, people, because you were talking about like the texture and stuff and, and in my mind, like we don't have to even get to steak to, to actually make an impact with what you're talking about because I don't know the numbers, but I have to assume it's a high percentage of meat is eaten in the form of burger, you yeah. know. Yeah, in the U.S., Nugget, it's about a quarter. Whatever. Yeah, it's about a quarter of meat is ground, like burgers, sausages, meatballs, nuggets, and so on. Um, yeah. So, so I guess the question is, do you do you see that as the first point of attack, or do you care? I mean, how do you how do you view that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's a great question. But I mean, yes, it, no doubt that is the lowest hanging fruit is these type of ground meats. Uh, ground meats are, are going to be, you know, it's probably 90 plus percent of the alternative meat market right now. Uh, there are some cultured meat companies that are doing thicker cuts of meat, um, but it's hard to do in that sense because, um, in short, the, you know, you have blood vessels and so that oxygenates the, um, you know, all your muscle tissue. But when you're in a bioreactor, there's no uh, vascular system. And so if you're trying to grow a whole cut of meat, the muscles on the inside go necrotic because they're not getting the nutrition that they need, and so you have to create a vascular system, essentially. You have to create like a scaffold that can actually do that. So it's definitely a more complex engineering problem and, and so on. Um, but it's not, it's not that it won't be overcome, it's just it's not gonna be the first thing. I was just joking, do you mind, Sarah, if we go to this, this woman? She has three questions. If they're quick we're, we're ones. gonna be really rapid. They better be yes or no <laughs> questions. So first the question is, uh, thank you very much for coming today. Thank the you first for coming. The question is, uh, uh, because you are the only one who will be the successful and all others will be loser. Of course, yes. So um, what is your revenues right now? Because I found the number, but uh, I don't think this is right. I have um, 3.8 million. Uh, I don't know where you're getting those revenues I know. from. So, you should claim it. Yeah. That, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if you want to sign an NDA and we can talk about your potential investment in the company, I'll be sure. very glad to talk about our revenue. Okay. With you. So, you, you want to disclose? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm cool right now, but okay. thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second question is not only the uh, big meat producers, but also the big companies, uh, multinational companies like uh, Nestle, Kellogg and then craft, and they already have uh, the major uh, plant-based uh, meat uh, companies, like yeah. uh, uh, Boca, uh, Morning Star Farms, mm -hmm. and yeah. then, you know, the, they are starting the new, uh, what, uh, Incognito? Incognito, yeah. Yes, yeah, so Incognito. Yeah. yes. and then those are the really big multinationals, and yeah. then, you know, some companies, uh, uh, they do, um, not really nice things in the emerging markets, like uh, baby formulas. Mm. If they can't sell, you know, in the U.S. because of regulations, they bring those not really good products overseas. Mm. And then the um, plant-based uh, products are mm -hmm. highly processed uh, well, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but there's lots of people who want to ask questions. I just want to right. make sure that they so, get to so ask those too. What do you think about this? You know, the big, uh, um, you know, craft catalogs coming in. Oh, I welcome it. I think it's awesome. Um, I haven't had Incognito, but um, you know, interestingly, for all the press that we hear about Beyond and Impossible, you know, the, the behemoth in the space is actually Morningstar. They sell the most amount of product right. in the plant-based meat space. They are losing market share, but they are still by far the biggest in this space. Uh, mainly through legacy. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think it's great. I, I like the whole premise of the Better Meat Co is to help the big players do better, to lighten their footprint. And so if companies like Kellogg and, and Kraft can lighten their own footprint by having more of their sales coming from plant-based rather than animal-based meats, uh, I would be thrilled. One more thing. All right, okay. let's hear it. Yes, last one. Um, as you know, the compared to the real burger, the uh, plant-based products have so much of the uh, uh, salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, mostly the burgers, they get probably 10 times more salt than the real burgers. Mm. It's definitely not ten times. Uh, that it's would be that times, would be like you know a week's times. worth of your right. uh, of your. But can you make your product without using so much of salt? Yeah, there's like the Achilles heel in the space, and uh, you know the products, the plant-based meat products, generally are better for you. They have zero cholesterol. They have less saturated fat. Um, and so on, but on salt, they don't always uh, stack up as well. And I, I think it's an Achilles heel for the space, and I do think that it will have to be addressed in a, a variety of ways. Uh, but to answer your question directly about the Better Meat Co., yeah, we do offer um, very low sodium versions of products for those of our customers who want it. Most of the time when they're making their products, they're already you know, seasoning it with some salt, so they're putting it in their meat already, so we don't have to. Um, but you know, it's a real, um, it, it is something I think is worth, uh, is, is worth doing, uh, worth, uh, I would say improving on in, in this space, but thank you. What other countries, by the way, are you referring to when you, when you're saying they're having bad practices in other countries? Yeah, for example, that's exactly the, about the plant-based meat. Okay. But the, yeah. for example, Nestle, uh -huh. with a baby formula, yeah. you know, they sell not so good products in the emerging market, Okay. Example. Okay, I got you. Uh, I thought you meant plant-based meat. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. All right. Well, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your answer. Hi. Um, so I read that part of the Series B that Memphis Meats received was regarding a pilot plant, and they're going to have, like, those the bioreactors like you described. Do you happen to know how many other companies might be moving on up into these bioreactors or yeah. is it just Memphis Meats? So think about the, like how much has been raised by these companies. Most of them, if they've raised at all, have raised like single digits millions. Um, Meetable in the Netherlands did just announce a $10 million raise. Um, and uh, Mosa Meats is also in the tens, but most of them have not raised enough where you could really build bioreactors of any size. You know, this is, this is like pharma scale biotech. It takes a lot of money to build any type of a large, um, any type of like a large plant, even a pilot plant. Um, in that case, for them, it's still gonna be tens of millions of dollars to do. So no, um, I, I think that all of these companies are operating with reactor sizes that are in the tens of liters or maybe a hundred liters at a time, but not in the, tens of thousands of liters yet. How much time do we have left? I just want to make sure. I'm not actually sure. All what right. time do we have to end, Kelly? 7.30-ish. Um, so okay. we only have time probably for one more question. I, I got to get Charles in here. He's been really going, he's been, he's been really uh, very vociferously raising his hand. This is Charles Maslin. He's the founder of Zeta Energy and uh, a battery with much higher density energy and uh, higher density for both weight and volume. Who is and his company has brought in tens of millions of dollars too. So he, he could probably he could probably answer these type of questions even better. All right, Charles, what's up? Yeah, when do you see the inflection? It, it, you have gigafactories, you have uh, in, in the battery industry, where uh, the the largest investments are really going to reap the benefits, mm -hmm. where they have economies of scale. And when do you see that inflection point happening? When it it, it, it turns when enough investment has come into this that it becomes. Uh, it, it, it becomes a numbers game. Uh, it's a really great question, Charles. I mean, I, I, the, the honest answer is I, I really don't know. But if I was just speculating on it, what I would say is that the Memphis investment is so dramatic. It's it's such like a you know punch to the chin that 
uh, it's going to attract more more investors of the space. They're saying, well, geez, you know, the money is going there. Let's do it. And so I think you're going to get a lot closer to that inflection point because of it. Um, but this space. You know, $161 million, it of course is a lot of money by any stretch of the imagination, but in order to actually get to commercial scale where you would see clean meat on supermarket shelves, it will take much more than that. So, so I'm thinking, is Memphis meat's kind of like the Tesla of, of cultured meat, but we're still at the Roadster stage? We still got really expensive <laughs> hamburgers? Well, Roadsters was a, Roadster was a car that people actually could purchase, so they're a little bit pre-Roadster. Oh, pre-Roadster. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for all of your questions and for coming. I'm sorry we don't have more time because I'm sure we could have talked for, for another hour, but yes. thank you so much thank for joining you, us. Thank you, Melissa. And I do want to say, before we get up, thank you. Um, in, in my selection of questioners, I was biased toward the people up here rather than up there. I know many of you had questions. If you want to ask questions, I'm happy to chat afterwards. If you want me to personally sign your book also, I'm happy to do that. Um, so, you know, we'll be around for a few minutes so you can come on down. And if you want my email, I've got business cards. Happy to give you that. You can reach out to me anytime for any reason. Always welcome hearing from you. Thank you again. Thank you.